So just grabbing a quick moment in the hallway with uh, Kim Cobb here, a 2010 Science and Public Leadership Fellow here at the PopTech Conference. And you were doing work on Earth's climate mm -hmm. and records in the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your research. Well, what I do is I study uh, coral paleoclimate records, which means I, I use corals to reconstruct climate of the past. And what that involves is going out to the islands in the middle of nowhere to try to hunt the climate signals that we're most interested in in the tropics, which is the El Nino events, as you may know, that occur sporadically every two to seven years um, along the equator. So that's where we have to go in order to reconstruct these climate events. We've been down there many, many times on different trains, planes, and automobiles, maybe not the trains part, but um, definitely uh, each expedition lends something new to my repertoire of, of great field stories. And what we do with these records is we look for patterns of class, past climate variability, um, current trends, and how they compare to the magnitude of past climate changes, trying to understand, of course, how uh, global warming related effects are impacting that area of the world for which we know uh, so little information from the instrumental climate record. So, and really extending the data sets that we have to inform the models on which we then predict the future of Earth's Right, our, our ultimate goal really is to try to compare the climate simulations of these time periods in the past with uh, the records that we actually have telling us what actually happened and see if those models can accurately reproduce that climate variability from the past. And we find that in general that they do well in some areas. For example, the 20th century trends seem to be pretty well reproduced. Um, but going back further in the past, uh, they seem to have more trouble. And this is particularly uh, problematic in terms of understanding you know, some of the limitations of their accuracies for projecting 21st century climate trends, for example. So I think one of the takeaways from the terrific talk that you gave on Thursday, the opening day of, uh, sort of the big uh, public pop tech uh, session, was um, that uh, the public is, is really grappling with the complexities of this issue because they sort of put all of the concerns about the validity of the science behind and then the certainties of the science behind climate change sort of in one big box. Yes, that's and, right. You know, so tell me a little bit more about that. Well, that's been really frustrating, of course, to go from what might have been seen as, as a relative high after something like the Al Gore movie with the message that that carried of importance and the recognition awareness that occurred after that movie. And then there's been a slow erosion of, of that information in terms of climate science awareness and, and people's understanding of what's going on. And I think that that's, you know, <laughs> kind of our own fault as climate scientists in messaging the, the point and taking over from where Al Gore left off and refining his message in terms of letting the public know what is settled science and what aspects of the work that we are doing represent highly uncertain areas of climate science. And we have kind of failed to distinguish between those two in some important ways and left ourselves open to some very bruising attacks, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I'd like to think about speaking to the 50% of Americans that don't believe that we are warming the planet by CO2 emissions and tell them that I understand uh, where they're coming from. And I understand, I think, why uh, the confusion exists and uh, we have ourselves to blame in part as climate scientists and we have an opportunity here to address exactly those folks with uh, more refined messages of packages of science that are settled science on the one hand and here's a suite of climate impacts of climate change that we don't understand yet and here's what we're working on to try to reduce those uncertainties and then from there have a non-scientific discussion about what we should do about it if anything so that's really a distinction I think the public needs to understand and climate scientists need to be much better about communicating. In, in brief, are there one or two things that you would say the public ought to regard as sort of yeah, the base of, of the pyramid that you drew for us, which is the things that scientific consensus would at least say are relatively certain, and then a couple of examples of the things that really need to be researched more before we can make you know, concrete predictions about where we're going? Right. I mean, the, the settled part of the science is clearly that the CO2 emissions that are, are resulting from fossil fuel burning are warming the planet. 
globally speaking. That is a certainty. And the fact that that is still not, of course, recognized by uh, all but one of the Republican senatorial candidates reflects the fact that this is an area of, of significant confusion for the public. That's settled. We have not really chosen to communicate that message as strongly as we could. And we have a trove of data, uh, real observational data, paleoclimate data of the sort that I generate, um, the model data that we have. Again, all of these things combining to the foundation of that scientific point, which I think the public needs to fundamentally understand is this happening. It, it is absolutely happening. Moving on from there, what are the impacts of this? All well and good to say the planet is warming, but what does it mean for rainfall in Georgia, for example, where I'm from? What does it mean for hurricane landfalls in Florida? What does it mean for the monsoons in India? These are the questions that are much more difficult to address with models and with data. We don't have a lot of rainfall data. We don't have a lot of hurricane data. So these and extreme events, what about the evolution of, of severe droughts and severe floods, the kind of events that truly disrupt our society? These things need a lot more study. So when we go about and we, we use that fear factor to, to scare people into action, that's where we begin to lose our path as scientists. So again, differentiating, this is a hypothesis, we are testing, we have some data to support this, but we are actively and, and uh, intensively researching these areas so we can provide better constraints about the things that people care most about. Kim, thank you so very much. Okay, great, thank you for having me.